So, hello everyone. Thanks a lot for joining us today. My name is Sandra, and I'm here in Folderly uh, taking a role of um, durability consultant. And my goal here is to understand how our clients using emails, um, uh, how to improve their uh, performance and how to bring them to the uh, top of what they can do. And I have my colleague Dan here with me who will also share lots of experience with us today. So Dan, could you uh, introduce us a little bit more? Absolutely. Hi, guys. Uh, hey, Sandra. I'm excited to get started. So yeah, I'm, my name is Dan. Um, I've been doing cold emailing for more than five years now. So uh, excited to share our experience, our insights, some non-obvious non hacks that we prepared for you today. And we collected them over like thousand cases right now. So we've been, uh, you know, digging into email quite, quite extensively. And uh, here's some things that no, not everybody knows. So, right. right? So we're not going to cover some, you know, super standard stuff. So we're going to go over some really not obvious little hacks that you can implement and actually make your email, emailing more successful. So let's get started. So, um, Let's start with why, what is email deliverability and why it is a thing, right? So as you know, email is getting more and more overcrowded each day. It's more and more people purchase email marketing solutions, more and more people doing their outbound, you know, chasing clients via cold emailing. And uh, email as a channel is getting more and more populated. So email service providers trying to kind of restrict their policies a little bit right, to, to make it a little harder to email in order to keep the channel valuable, right? So imagine if you ha would have like in the morning, like 5,000 emails where, where everybody will just email each other. So email will lose its value as a channel, right? So uh, it's actually a good thing that uh, not everyone uh, will uh, deliver their emails because there are, of course, a lot of bad people, but we're talking about, you know, legit businesses trying to make email work and how to do it, right? So every day, more than 333 billion emails. So it's a cool number, right? 333, but it's actually true that every day people send more than 300 billion emails. And, um, you know, a lot of more than 50% goes straight to spam. So uh, this is something that we're going to cover today, how your business, how you can avoid this, actually. Yeah, basically, I mean, as you see, if you rely on emails at some point of your business, you have to take email delivery into consideration. And that's why we are going to talk about like some most unobvious but very useful hacks that you can implement, I mean, starting from today. So yeah, uh, we are gathered uh, like a ten, top 10, I would say very unobvious things that you should do, start doing from today. And uh, that's that comes from our eight year of collaboration collective experience. So I think you're going to enjoy that. So let's start with the first one. Let's do it. So what is DNS and why BIMI, B-I-M-I, is important to configure? So um, let's start with the, the concrete foundation, right? So no matter, you know, no matter what you're going to do, no matter what type of email you're going to implement within your, uh, within your company, the DNS setup and the domain is actually the concrete foundation. Without it, everything just doesn't make sense, right? So a uh, domain name system. So what, what they are and what, what to do with them, right? So uh, in order to start emailing, if you have a new domain, right? You had it in the past and just started doing some email marketing or cold outreach. It's actually important and crucial to make your domain look good for the email service provider. And there are like about five different settings responsible for authenticating your domain as a sender, right? So um, there are like DMARC policies, there are DKIM, there are like SPF, like sender policy for framework. But uh, like not to dig in like to everything, uh, to every particular one in detail, but to say that uh, it's actually super, like you cannot avoid it, right? Without it, you're not going to be authenticated as sender. And the recipient side, the recipient's like uh, email client, email provider, email server will simply like 
won't recognize your email, right? And just put it straight to spam because they cannot really verify the email coming from your domain, right? So it's important actually to tell the ESP, okay, I have everything in place. It's really me who's sending that email, not some bad person just sent, you know, sending the email and just signing to be signing with my domain. So it's actually me. I'm using, for example, like HubSpot or MailChimp or Active Campaign for my sending. And this is what's included. This is my digital footprint. So yeah, well, uh, that email can be placed to the inbox. So uh, one particular, like it's the newest one, like besides DKIM, DMARC, SPF, MX Records, the newest one is BME. BIMI and Sandra will, uh, will you know, uncover what, what is that and why it's important. Yeah, sure. So actually, that's as Dan said, it's a pretty, I mean, uh, new record. Uh, very few people know about that. That's what we see from our experience. And every second client comes to us, they have no idea about uh, what is this and how to configure that. So that's like one of the points we're working on. And uh, just like starting with the basics, what is BIMI or BIMI, if you like? Uh, it's basically, um, I mean, uh, you can uh, understand it as something that identifies you as a brand. But uh, meaning that it's a brand uh, indicator for message uh, identification. So uh, it means that whenever you send your emails to your prospects, to your clients, uh, it's going to reflect your logo uh, on it even before they actually going to open that and see what's inside. Uh, how it's important. First of all, it works together with other records uh, that actually uh, help to identify uh, you as a reliable sender uh, by email service provider and they will kind of like place this email to the inbox. That's like the, our first goal. The second thing, it helps you to stand out from the crowd of other emails because most of the companies, they have them, don't have this configured. So when you see like a loads of emails and only one of them with a logo, they can probably open that one or at least have a look at this at the subject line, which we are working on as well. And uh, apart from um, like making you stand out, it also helps you to uh, kind of like um, protect yourself, your domain, your company identity uh, by uh, uh, proving that only you is uh, like allowed and you're actually a holder of this uh, um, logo. And this is how you can connect it to your domain. Again, the main thing why email deliverability is a thing is break through the noise, right? So average person in the morning, I'm getting like, I don't know, 50 emails, right? So not a, not all of them are important. Not not all of them I want to pay my attention to devote my time, right? So and that thing is just a little, I uh, will, you know, just add a little advantage to your brand to actually get noticed and break to this, through this noise. So thank you, Sandra. And let's move to the second slide, which is smart delay between emails for cold outreach. So that's a super complex topic, but we're going to just condense it to one one single truth is uh, if you're doing cold emailing, if you have like SDR team, you're reaching out to prospects, uh, there's certain natural limit for the ESPs, both for like if you're using corporate Gmail or Google Workspace, or if you're using Outlook or Exchange, there's like certain number of emails you can send daily. But on top of that, not everybody knows about it, right? So there needs to be like a smart delay between each email. Why it is important? Because again, cold outreach is kind of like a real email emulation, right? So it's not like a blast. So uh, you're using your own mailbox for it. And, uh, you know, in the eyes of ESP, if you're sending like 30 emails in single single minute or like every other email, every like third or fourth second, it's, it's kind of suspicious, right? So not, you know, if you're a superhuman, you can do it, right? So uh, like an average, average person just cannot type so fast, right? So that's why those smart delays are important. Imagine like one cold email going out like now and the next one in like 66, 66 seconds. And another one is like in 90 seconds or 120 seconds. But the healthy, like healthy number here is like 120 seconds between each emails. And that can be also randomized. If you're using some, some sales engagement software, you can actually randomize that delay. So the main goal in that cold sending and that outbound sending is to make sure that, uh, you know, to mimic real human behavior. And that will actually help you. So set up your limit, not more than 200 emails per rep per mailbox right? So, and also not forget to uh, establish that smart delay. That way you can actually save, you know, send emails more scalably, more successfully. So uh, 
that is, I think that's it. So let's move on to the second slide. Maybe Sandra, you have yeah, something actually, to add here. I'd like to add one thing which I face like quite often when I'm talking to someone new who is coming to us. Uh, whenever they select a, a tool that they are planning to use for their uh, for the cold campaigns automation, they never look at the ability to set up this delay. So that's something you have to pay attention to so that this provider should at least give you a chance to um, select among the suggested, uh, I mean, the timing, but at the same time, if they allow you to set up your own, that's going to be great. Uh, just aim at something bigger. I mean, look, I mean, think about you writing the email. I mean, uh, try to check, I mean, how much time it takes you to write this, uh, like, three, four sentence email, and then set up this delay in your own um, automation system. Exactly. So let's move on to the next slide, which is get a look like domain for a cold outreach that directs to your main domain. So what is it, why it is important? So uh, as you can imagine, a lot of companies send too, too many cold emails, right? So if you're a startup, if you're scaling fast, you want to send more, you want to receive more replies, you want to make it faster. But uh, there are certain rules that uh, ESPs will simply not allow you to break. So uh, to uh, kind of mitigate that risk, to make it more risk averse, it's actually beneficial to move your like, risky sending from your main domain to another one, like lookalike. So for example, if your domain is like apple.com, just assuming, right? So you can create something similar like appleteam.com or joinapple.com, right? So maybe it's like a stupid example, but you know, just create something similar. When, uh, when you type that email to the browser, it will actually redirect you to, to your main website. Uh, why it is important to uh, make sure that that super, super high risk sending, because you know, you're sending the cold email, uh, that person really is not really right uh, aware of who you are, what are you trying to, to do with that email, what you're trying to send. So, uh, and also on top of that, that's, you know, risky from the technical perspective, where you're sending that email, uh, you know, the you're always sending to new domains, new mailboxes every day, day after day, week after week, month after month. However tailored your message is, however great job you made, like compiling that list of like list of uh, prospects or leads, whatever you call them, not every cold email gets the attention you want. So some of them might get ignored, some of them might get just forgotten. Some like some person can just have a bad day and move that email into spam. So it's uh. It's kind of risky, right? So to to make sure you're not blacklisted, to make sure that uh, your reputation stays the same, and you have like a second, like a safe harbor, right, <laughs> to send from. So you just create that domain, yeah. keep keep it in a good shape. So whenever you have like maybe some concern, okay, I might be getting into spam. You can easily switch to that newly created similar domain, which will allow you to actually continue sending to, uh, for. for you know, to, to keep your pipeline pipeline going, to keep your forecast, to to keep your revenue coming from that email channel. So the yeah. thing is that I wanted to add to lookalike domains is the thing, especially uh, there are some industries that are working with purchased databases, and uh, still, I mean, for some reason, uh, it ha it contains some spam traps and blacklist blacklist traps. So if you are sending this, I mean, if you do mass emailing to this purchased uh, databases, make sure you have something safe aside uh, your main business domain because you don't want to have this blacklist. That's like a uh, rule of thumb, even though if uh, sometimes lookalike domains, uh, I mean, see, there is the difference between lookalike domains. I mean, uh, we are currently talking about some like extensions, uh, different extensions, but same uh, base name. But at the same time, uh, just avoid having something that will look like a phishing to your clients. So, I mean, be moderate when you create your domains. That's like, uh, yeah. be moderate is actually is a good advice is about anything you might For do. For everything, right? That's That's true. That's true. So, um, and one thing to add here, so Sundry touched that point. So if you're emailing, of course, like everybody is just using some for sort of lead provider or LinkedIn sales navigator and getting leads from somewhere. It's also like, it's, you know, you cannot just avoid it. Just make sure you validate your list. You make sure all the emails are valid because otherwise it's going to end pretty soon for you. So you're going to just stop your outbound because everything will go to sp spam. Just make it, Make it essential for before you send out. Make sure you have no no spam traps. You, you have no catch-alls. You have 
uh, you know, only 100% green, valid, beautiful email that you're going to send out to that there is a person behind that email because, uh, you know, you might be sending less, but still you're going to keep your domain health stable. You're going to keep your reputation at the high level. And that's what you want, right? So let's move on to the next slide, which is uh, be risk averse and keep two ESPs for better reach. So, um, Sandra, you can start and I, I will let, add up to that. Yeah, sure. So, uh, I mean, this uh, this point is continuous, uh, connected to the previous topic because um, you can connect like one ESP to your domain. And the thing is, I mean, uh, the good thing to have like two ESPs or even more, I mean, if you if you can do that, uh, is actually for a better reach because uh, it's some uh, at some point it's quite easy to like get into the spam with some particular ESP, but be out of this and in other. So if you want to keep reaching all your prospects, all, all your clients, I mean, whoever you're trying to communicate to, is actually to have this uh, ability to connect to connect with them from different ESPs that will uh, basically provide you with a chance to like being seen, being placed to the inboxes rather than flagged as something unreliable. Exactly. And uh, one point to add here is that uh, if you if you take entire like business B2B emailing inf infrastructure like uh, as a whole, right? Uh, their their main ESPs like Gmail is about like sixty plus percent of like, entire business emails in the world. Outlook is also like a huge player, about like thirty percent, and like all the other ones just cover that ten percent. So it's always good to keep like, for example, corporate Gmail and corporate Outlook connected to your like subdomain or that lookalike domain, right? Which we talked about in the previous slide, and make sure that whatever like if you're feeling like some of that emails. Uh, that you send from Gmail, not quite lent to the Outlook. You can just, you know, take those contacts, move it to uh, another, you know, another uh, like outreach solution or something connected to Outlook, which will allow you to, um, you know, maximize the results. Because, you know, we we all know that all those data providers, you're purchasing leads, they're, you know, they're, they're cost some money to you, right? So it's always good to, um, you know, squeeze the lemon twice. I, I would put it that way. So we all know that links are important emails, right? So, you know, you're sending plain text, you're not sending huge like GIFs or pictures or attachments, but links, they're pretty much essential to the emailing. You want to point them to your portfolio website. You want to show them some case studies. You want to show them, you know, how, how great you are, how cool your product is. But uh, links are risky. Again, emailing is getting more and more harder. Even links are always kind of, uh, you need to just find the right way to share your links. So um, I will just start with, um, yeah, I let Sandra talk about uh, why it is uh, important to pay attention to, and then I will share like the safe way to do it. So to yeah. add some value here. So actually, as a rule of thumb here is avoid sending anything but uh, that is not a plain text that comes to cold outreach. Uh, why is it so? Because like every email you send to your recipient is scanned. I mean, basically whatever is inside of that email is scanned by uh, spam filters of your email, or of actually their email providers mm -hmm. uh, on the spam words and links, attachments, or like any, any, any phishing stuff. So anything that could go wrong uh, when you're uh, basically when their client opened that email. So uh, there is a great chance if you do add something to your email, you're going to be put into spam automatically without actually having, um, I mean, being considered <laughs> so regardless of your any of your previous actions. So the thing is, uh, try to refrain from using HTML. That's actually something uh, I would say even forbidden for cold outreach because, uh, I mean, we'll talk about why later uh, uh, talking about the size of email, but still, I mean, consider not to use HTML formats, do not use links, videos, attachment, pics, and sometimes uh, even the email signatures because it also contains links and images and some, some stuff additional which you don't want to harm your send reputation for it. So uh, why to do that if you can do like, uh, you can use a safe way that Dan is going to talk about now, um, how to send the links if you absolutely have to. Absolutely. So again, uh, I will uh, repeat that because it's super important. 
the if you're sending code, right? So if you're sending like um, promos or transactional emails, if you're sending like newsletter, blog, whatever you have your subscriber list, if you're doing some email marketing, there are like a lot of links and you can simply not avoid it. But if you're sending to people that don't know you, you're sending from your Gmail, there's actually only one way you can share links. First, first point I'm going to touch is uh, actually try to refrain sending links in your first email in the sequence, first email in the cadence, because you know, uh, imagine you're in the ESP, right? And you see that, okay, this person never emailed that that another person, right? And he's sending a link right away. So it's pretty obvious that the ESP might think it's some spam link or some scam link or just some phishing link, whatever. So they will most likely just block this message and send it straight to spam, right? S but if you're sending it like a third or fourth follow-up, you've sent some you know, emails to that person, actually might have opened it, might have you know, spent some time on the email, and that's being tracked by the ESPs. Again, uh, email service providers track the behavior of your user with your emails, and this is how they pretty much make, like this is how they gauge your sender score. But if you want to send like a link to your portfolio or a case study or whatever, just try to send a link that points back to that domain you're sending from. So if I'm sending from folderly.com, right, and I'm I'm sending some link to a case study, that should point to folderly.com, not some you know uh, reviews website, not some YouTube. Just point back to your website, and that's the only the only way you can uh, you can say send links without compromising your domain health without risking your reputation. Again, touching on the point of breaking through the noise and making sure that you're getting noticed, right? Because the the most valuable thing right now in today's world is, you know, time and attention of your user of your lead, right? So don't try to send everything in the world. Who you who you are, what do you do? Your case study. So nobody reads that extra large email. So Keep it short. Again, that's everybody knows that, but it's we're seeing that not everybody pays attention. A lot of people just send huge emails, and that's actually not good. So just keep in mind that any email just should fit in one home screen. Just no scrolls. Just so people can open that email, read it once, not touch their screen again, and make and just understand. Okay, should I send? Should I reply to that person? Or you know, it's some some invaluable information for me. So. N not obvious, but you know it's again one one of the su super super uh, crucial things for emailing. Just don't send like uh, articles. Send something as you would send to your friend in the in the WhatsApp or you know Telegram or whatever signal. So that's super short hack, but it's not even a hack. But it's just a good thing to remind. So next one. The very first question I'm, ask, I'm asking people when I start talking to them is actually, what's your email volume? I mean, uh, what are you trying to achieve? And usually they're trying to push like thousands of emails per day through one mailbox and then wondering what's happening with the remote placement. That's the thing. Uh, there is a certain limit imposed by email providers, exceeding which will significantly drop your chances of, uh, I mean, being placed anywhere at all. Um, sometimes you can even get blocked out, especially if it's a new um, domain or a new mailbox. So uh, the safe way, and frankly speaking, is the only right way here is to scale through adding more mailboxes rather than increasing the volume of your emails uh, within one mailbox. Uh, why is it so? Uh, because... Uh, mm, you, I mean, consider just sending uh, about like a couple of hundred email from uh, one mailbox because uh, just referring back to one of the points we already discussed, we are creating here a human-like action. So imagine that one person cannot send thousands of emails per day. Imagine yourself typing those emails. You cannot do something over two to 300 emails. So that's the limit you should stick to. And if you want to scale, if you want to add up on top of what you're currently doing, uh, just add more mailboxes. And another thing which I also noticed is that scaling usually is connected to the team growth. So if you're getting used those people you're getting is the or videos into your team make sure to get them on mailbox i mean don't make them share this 
Yeah, so that's yeah. basically yeah how it works. Yeah, so again, touch, touching on the numbers, so the safe range, the safe limit for cold outreach is anywhere between 150 and 200 emails daily, right? So if you have a goal to reach like 1,000 people a day, it's, it's really easy to create an, just another mailbox with just slightly different names. So I'm Dan. I have another mailbox, which is Daniel. I have another mailbox, which is Daniel dot my last name, which, which allows me to send more emails, reaching more customers, and at the same time, not compromising my domain health and making sure I'm, 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 I'm staying within limits and I'm being successful at it. So uh, the next slide, get separate domains for, for cold and warm emails. And this is you know, close to a topic we, we've we covered already, but um, whenever we're speaking to customers and they're sending everything through one domain, it's actually pretty, pretty risky because you have your sales team, you have your marketing team, they're sending completely different emails to different audiences and the goal of that email are like two, two, two different goals, right? So they aim to get to a different point, right? So it's a good thing to uh, make sure that your sales team does not harm your marketing team and your marketing team does not harm your sales team. And they're pretty much uh, just keeping two baskets separate because uh, whenever uh, you add new SDRs, you know, whenever you add more emails to cold, to cold sometimes just people, they forget to validate the content. They forget not to send more than 200 emails. That's normal. Like sometimes people hire hiring new reps and um, sometimes they're doing something on their own, right? And that might damage the entire organization that might damage the domain reputation of the warm senders and marketing team actually suffers from, you know, not converting email, you know, people from email marketing, sending them some blogs or whatever. So uh, it's actually a wonderful strategy to make sure that you're sending cold email from one domain. Again, it could be a subdomain, but ideally it should be in just completely separate entity. And just your cold people, cold senders, salespeople are sending from another one. So just keep two baskets separate, be risk averse, and that way, I, you know, each department will have their own responsibility responsibility for the reputation because indeed like the goals of you know of their emailing is like completely completely different so uh something to add here sandra yeah i mean just uh, one sentence here i would like to add is basically having separate domains or even subdomains will help you to measure the results of both teams without mm -hmm. having all this figure confused so why not to use that yeah Exactly. So uh, let's move on to the next slide, which is check your templates for spam words. Uh, it's most, I think it's both obvious and not obvious at the same time, but uh, spam words are tricky. And uh, there are a lot of spam words that you cannot even think of as a spam word, right? So it's always, always beneficial for your success to check for spam words so there is like it's publicly available information you can google like 400 spam words for 2022 and just try avoid like at least first 100 because you know the more people overuse a single word the more it's getting like flagged and noticed by the esp and the more you use it within your own templates, the more likelihood they, that your email will actually go to straight to spam. So um, you can use your external uh, external sources for that. But uh, within uh, within Folderly, we also do have this spam word checker, and that's that's really it surprised me sometimes when it when we have like a new sequence. I'm uploading it to Folderly to actually warm up that. Uh, another another piece of content that we're sending and you know it's a usual word it's nothing too crazy but it lights up in spam so you better just change it for some synonym or, or an alternative because um again emailing is getting more 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 and more complicated so even using words like not just obvious words like promotions or discount but something like today might be also like a spam word. So uh, that's it for me, Sandra. Anything to add? What uh, like what's your experience with spam words? 
Uh, yeah, the thing is that the spam words is actually, as you said, is always not, or not obviously the same thing because that's something you look at the very least. I mean, when you have created your campaign, you created all your sequences, and then suddenly you have to change a lot of things. And yeah, also recently got to know from one of our clients that they used to use a service that were like basically charging them for every email they were checking um, on having spam words. And I mean, for us, it's already inbuilt, so why to do that? Uh, but anyway, mm -hmm. it's important to, um, to to check your spam words because, as I said, whenever your emails are landing to someone's uh, mailbox, before they're actually going to be landed there, they are checked on content, whatever is inside. And having spam words, one or two even, sometimes can uh, drop down your sender rate significantly. So again, you couldn't reach their inbox, which is your main goal here. Regularly perform an email deliverability test. Know what's happening. Yeah, Sandra, go ahead. Yeah, exactly. So uh, the thing is that uh, email deliverability test gives you an idea of what directions to work on. Because as you see already, I mean, we have covered so many topics on how to improve this and that. And it's, uh, it's all about email infrastructure, about the content, about your leads, about everything. And uh, it's important to know what to look at because, if, uh, I mean, uh, the more faster you can find the problem, then you can resolve it and move on. I mean, get your business back. So it's it, it actually helps you to find out what holds you back and what to improve on. And um, a good durability test uh, has a few points that, I mean, I, I think it's an industry standard. They should tell you about your email placement. I mean, basically, it shows you uh, the performance in different ESPs where your email is landing and to which folders they're landing. Also, it is crucial to know um, what's uh, how how's your DNS records. I mean, to test them out and make sure that everything is configured correctly. So again, you are authorized sender and all your emails are going to be at least delivered to the mailbox, but then based on whatever um, else um, spam folder is re um, working on, they will be placed in a particular folder, but still you have to make sure that that, that thing is correct. And also um, some advanced tests will tell you um, what's wrong with your content. Basically, they are performing a check of your content. They are going to highlight your spam words, maybe a, a blocked or like broken links. So anything that could prevent you from landing to the inboxes of your prospects uh, within your content also should be highlighted by such tests. And the most important yeah. thing here is uh, when you're selecting your provider, I mean, whoever is going to perform the test for you, um, you have to uh, find that one who will let, who won't leave you alone uh, in this journey, who will guide you through and help you understand what to target and uh, how to deal with all of that. And uh, covering all the, that information about email deliverability test, why it is important, uh, we've prepared a short, like super small, but very pleasant bonus for you, which is a uh, free email deliverability test. So take out your phone, scan this QR code, and uh, we'll, uh, we'll give you that pretty much free of charge so you can understand where your emails are being placed to, what's your uh, ratio of emails going to spam versus promotions versus spam, or inbox versus promotion versus spam, sorry. So that will give you like a starting point, actually understanding what's going on and how to, uh, like from which direction, from which side to approach this email deliverability thing right that we talked about today a lot and finally q a questions and answers the very first question we get i think at every webinar we are conducting is if it's going to be recording it definitely it is so if you register it if you're here that it, it means that you can receive your copy uh once we are ready to share that so just look at it in your mailboxes you're probably going to receive it within a couple of days Okay, second most popular question in our chat is how to set up your DNS records. And that's an amazing question because that's something you should start with. Um, I, I myself call it a step zero whenever it comes to uh, your availability, I mean, managing your availability. And the thing is that uh, there are two ways to deal with that. Uh, first is to try to figure out yourself. Uh, there are tons of information online which you can read through and actually understand how it works. But the thing is, you're going to spend so much time uh, doing that and there's a lot of controversial things that you're going to find online. So if you um, look into 
basically delegate this to someone, uh, to experts, just find the company who are doing that. I mean, who, who, are, who is offering um, this as a part of their services. I do think uh, there are a lot of them, but uh, we are also, I mean, uh, so, and yeah, but basically choose which one, which way is going to work for you and then go with it. Yeah, Okay. exactly. Okay, so the next question is, just give me a moment. There are tons of questions about DNS records here. Um, okay, so you recommend we redirect the secondary domain to our primary domain. Uh, there are two ways to actually have, uh, you know, a similar, similar lending page or similar website or like a specifically dedicated landing page for emailing, so which says, Thank you for uh, thank you for visiting the, visiting that website. We we'll sent a cold email to you. Let's talk. But uh, you know the best strategy would be just redirect back to your main website because that's something you pay most attention to. You you're grooming. You're you know you're investing a lot of time and effort into making a beautiful thing. So uh, for the secondary domain is the best strategy. Just redirect back to your to your main website, unless it's some special, like special promotion, a special offer going on. So uh, yeah. OK, so the next question is actually about what Outlook in Gmail is, because uh, someone thought that it's um, like email mailbox providers, but not ESPs. The thing is that uh, I would say it's just a different names for the same thing. Uh, if you want to get the mailbox, you're probably going to go to one of these providers, uh, especially, again, if you're talking about something called, uh, I mean, for a cold outreach. So yeah, that's pretty much just the same thing. Yeah. Uh, Okay, so reply, yeah, so uh, as you see, we are doing the Q&A session, and again, you're going to get this in recording, so you can look it at uh, whenever you need. Uh, okay, so Google Drive uh, is okay to use as the link um, in uh, if they manage my domain, or, or, I, or I need to redirect it to my main website. Uh, well, I don't think that Google Drive link is okay, is okay here, because it's not pointing to your website. Mm -hmm. um, is there advice about fitting the email on one phone screen referring to cold email outreach? Um, uh, yeah, basically this advice is referred to the cold email outreach because that's something you can actually squeeze your message in and uh, deliver it in a few sentences. And just consider, I mean, whenever you write cold emails, consider yourself reading this email. I mean, at what sentence you're going to stop reading that? And mm -hmm. that's probably how you can fit it all in one screen, having nice few like targeted sentences and being like uh, below the limits. Yeah. And before you start sending that campaign, just send one test emails to your to your phone, just try and read it from your from your screen and uh, make sure that if you if you would get this message, would you respond? Is it, you know, because when I'm when I'm overwhelmed with Instagram, TikTok, work, Gmail, anything, another person sending me like twenty sentences to read through with some complicated <laughs> language, that's not something that would get a lot of attention. So just be sure, tell tell who you are, why you're reaching out, what do you want to do with it, and uh, make sure that you have a clear next step within that emailing. Not not leave, don't leave your prospect wondering, okay, I got this message. Like, so what? So the, the, the most, uh, the, the, the most, ex like the most important question your prospect needs to find answer in your code emailing is one simple question is, so what? So, um, yeah, the, let's go on to the next question. So, okay, domains questions. Um, is it better to create a new domain or a subdomain for different purposes? Then, what do you have to say Both, about that? So, uh, again, if you're uh, if you're sending some cold email, keep cold emails outbound, not cold people don't know you, and you're sending at the same time you send some promotional blog posts, you're sending some kind of email marketing stuff, right? So you have a list of subscribers who actually allow you to send emails to them. It's better to use completely separate domain. That way you have two different uh, outlets, right? And that way you in control of single one, you have full control because uh, 
Of course, you can create some subdomains, and a lot of people do it. In our experience, uh, the the better performance actually comes from having two completely separate domains. But uh, you know, subdomains work as well. Uh, it's a little bit harder to, harder to control, but uh, if it's crucial for you, there is no like no strict uh, no strict rules about that as well. Yeah, basically, you are the one who can choose whatever is going to work best for you. Um, okay, on to the next question. So if an entrepreneur has a taken list, you are saying they need 50 mailboxes. Uh, no, <laughs> uh, we are not saying that they can send 200 emails like at all from your mailbox. You can do that in a day. So uh, if you are trying to outreach 10,000 people on a daily basis, then probably, yes, you would need to have, a, I mean, more wide uh, email infrastructure. But if it's just the list you're working on and you're like outreaching a portion of this list every day, then, mm -hmm. I mean, just count it based on that. I mean, let's say you're sending it 1,000 uh, 1, email per day, just uh, you would need five mailboxes for, for that. Exactly. Okay, so um, the next question is: Does it make a difference if you send if you're sending uh, your emails, I guess, from uh, different aliases at the same domain? So, uh, if you look into the alias emails, if you look into the so source code of it, everything at the end is coming to your main domain, right? So uh, that is something that's non obvious, but at the end, that email will go out from your primary, from your primary one. So uh, we suggest to avoid aliases because it's more decentralized. It's a little harder to control, and there are a lot of different variables to take, take, into, uh, take into account here. So um, aliases are kind of tricky. So just um, make sure that, you know, it's still a way, right? But it's, you know, for average user, it's more hard to control. So I would just suggest having completely separate mailboxes with separate names. So uh, you have a full control. You have, uh, you know, exactly exactly what you want to do here. So which is having your emails within the inbox of your recipient. So don't overcomplicate things. Just have a com completely separate domain, have a completely separate mailbox, and you, you're going to be good. Yeah, and the thing is that I actually I haven't encountered any services that will allow you to work on your sender reputation on Alice. So uh, you just leave it as it is and hope it's going to perform um, good until some point of time when it's just out in spam and you cannot mm -hmm. do anything about that. So... Uh, yeah. What to risk this? If you have a, a copy, a, a right copy, yeah, no, no, no that's okay. <laughs> if you have a right copy for cold and uh, warm traffic, you don't. Uh, I don't think you would necessarily need uh, multiple domains. Well, uh, yeah, that's that's a, that's a good approach. But the thing is, uh, you want to uh, avoid the risks of like losing your domains, or I mean, even at some for some point of time. I mean, uh, it could be months, it could be days. Uh, just um, I, I mean, I would say have at least one domain as a backup is a decent practice. But again, it's totally up to you if you want to implement something like that. Yeah, and a good good thing to add here is uh, that. Cold emailing is kind of, it's risky, technically speaking. And also people don't pay the attention you want to your cold emails, right? So not every every cold email will be opened. Not everyone will get attention it deserves, right? So, um, and as you scale, as you grow your business, if you're like one, one man shop, right? So you're controlling everything, that is a good way to to start with just having the right copy for your code, the right templates, right beautiful d uh, designed uh, emails for your warm sending, right, amazing. But as you scale, the more the more people you hire, uh, you're going to be just harder to control. And sometimes, you know, it all contributes. Like every sending outlet is contributing to you know that one main thing, which is the domain reputation. And one bad behavior, one bad practice can damage the entire organization. And that's you something that you don't want to do, right? You don't want to lose your revenue. You don't want to have your emails within spam. That's why it's important to uh, be risk averse. And if you're not using them, just keep them for the for the sake of just being in the safe 
yeah, safe a zone plan. here, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Have a back backup plan. Have a plan B. It's a it's a, it's an amazing strategy, right? Remember, remember COVID, right? COVID times where every everyone just had a plan A, but then we learn how to have a plan B, plan C, and I think um, it's it's a wonderful strategy to scale. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, to add up to that, I mean, since, I mean, uh, even though we recommend uh, having like a couple of domains uh, at your disposal, um, we do not recommend just to like use domains and throw it away. Uh, we are like, uh, I mean, myself included, uh, we are working here to improve and grow your current uh, domain reputation. So um, any like future reports or anything, any like uh, negative behavior will not impact that. But at the same time, I mean, just uh, having one, maybe two domains as a backup plan is, is a good strategy. So again, it's totally up to you if you want to do that. Is there a way to see where the spam rate come, uh, is coming from? I can see it on the Postmaster tool, but I'm not sure um, what is creating it. Product emails, called outreach, did someone send a mass email? That's a combination, always a combination. There is not, not one single single piece to it so or maybe your bounces or maybe again your uh your copy maybe your sender reputation which is uh the the combination of the track record what has been happening with your email within the inbox of your recipient right and that's i think one of the most important one there may be a lack of like dkim record or dmark or spf or you know some if even though if you have it, sometimes the policies change and you need to update them constantly. So <clears throat> always like we're working with, I think, you know, with three new clients a day, right? So we're adding up, yeah, we're scaling up, up super fast. So uh, there's always a combination. And uh, even for us, we're controlling like different, different uh, aspects, different factors of our emailing to make it, to make it to make it successful, to make it uh, scalable and profitable. So uh, just in the meantime, just go to deliverability test and it's going to tell you like a little more information about like what's the reason, what's the root cause of your, uh, of your problems, if there are any. One of our previous tips that we gave for this webinar is actually relatable to that. Just keep different type of emailing on different domains. That's going to tell you that what's probably causing the most problem, what to look at. And what else I find really helpful, but which is not really obvious, when you work on your sender score through tools like Spamfix and Folderly, it gives you a logs. Uh, so basically, it tells you if your email is going to the inbox, to spam, to promotions, undelivered, basically What's the status of that email? And when you start your campaign and you see, um, I mean, logs that like spam, spam, spam uh, in folder or tools like ours, um, I mean, it gives you an idea of what it comes from. So which uh, which campaign is correlates with the time um, that logged uh, back there. So yeah, as an idea, you can use something like that as well. Okay, so that was our last question. Perfect. So uh, it was a pleasure. So um, we might prepare another 10 ones for you. So we're all, always finding a new one. So I expect something similar coming either within our blog or we can do another webinar. So there are not only those, right? So those are like an additional ones. So they're pretty much um, some, you know, essential components of your emailing, which you can find on our website. You know, we have a lot of guides, we have a lot of materials, how to make your emailing successful. Uh, we've covered like very non, non obvious, but really important things to uh, pay attention to. But always, we have a lot of resources for our clients. We have a lot of resources for pe people who are sending emails. Sometimes they're just, you know, <laughs> utilizing our uh, our website as a resource, even though they're not our like final final customer or user. So make sure you just take a visit to our website, and uh, we hope to see you soon again.